Good morning, Christ Covenant Church. Good morning. My name is Tony Wong, and it's a great honor for me to be here sharing with you God's Word today. Born and raised in China, I became a believer um, when I was 10 years old. After completing my degree at Reformed Theological Seminary, I was called by the Lord to minister to Chinese immigrants here in this area. Blessed by, by Christ's covenant, our church, our PCA church plant, gathers here every Sunday afternoon to worship our Lord. To me, this pulpit is a somewhat familiar place for me to be. And I am very, very grateful to stand here and share with you God's holy word. About six months ago, Pastor Brian sent me an email to share with me what was happening to believers in a church in China. Starting on December 9th, 2018, Chinese authorities launched a crackdown on Early Rain Covenant Church, a Chinese Presbyterian church located in the city of Chengdu, a city in southwest China. Over 200 members of the church have been arrested since then, including their lead pastor, Wang Yi, who was detained in a secret location with no communication with anyone whatsoever. When Pastor Brian asked me to preach, I asked for his permission to speak on the topic of the persecuted church, particularly those that are in China. What happened last December at Early Rain Covenant Church was only one of the thousands of incidents of persecution in China every year. Seemingly far away from our life in the warm and comfortable South Florida, my goal today is to direct you back to the biblical perspective on persecution. The Lord calls us to remember those who are suffering for their faith. As a matter of fact, for our faith. Those who are suffering for the sake of their faith are in fact our brothers and sisters in Christ. We are in faith of one body. Nothing gives me more joy than seeing God's people listen to God's word and be transformed by God's word. The scripture passage for today's sermon is found in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 3. My goal today, as in every Sunday, is to bring the biblical truth to the life of God's people. My task today is to expound the meaning of this one verse, Hebrews 13, 3. I believe within this verse, this very short verse, bears extremely important truth, particularly for us who are not facing persecutions in America. I invite you to open your Bible to Hebrews chapter 13. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Hebrews 13, 3. Remember those who are in prison, as though in prison with them and those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. We pray with me. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we ask you to speak to our hearts this morning by your word. Even as we are studying only one verse today, we ask for your illumination. It is our desire that we may be transformed and conformed to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we know that only you can do so by grace through the work of your Spirit. Father, be with us today and sanctify us by your word. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. 
Did you know that? Last year, 4,136 Christians were killed for faith-related reasons. On average, that is 11 Christian, Christians killed every single day for their faith. Did you know that? 245 million Christians are experiencing high levels of persecution on this day. That is, every nine Christians in the world, one is facing severe persecution. Did you know that? There have been more people killed for their faith in Jesus Christ in the 20th century than all the previous 19 combined. Did you know that? Each Sunday, including today, as we worship here undisturbed, around 200 churches in China are being harassed in just a matter of hours ago. A number of them were worshiping for the very last time as a church since authorities closed down churches every Sunday. When we consider the topic of persecution, many of us, including myself, may find it hard to relate to. Although I was born and raised in China, it was nine years ago when I lived in China lastly. After all, we live in the USA, the land of free, free to worship our God, free to live out our faith. My parents became believers when I was 10 years old. The first thing they did after they became Christians was that they started to take me to church. Growing up, I faced nearly to none persecutions in the church that I attended in China until I left the country in 2010 for graduate school in Canada. I thought things were getting better. I thought religious freedom was finally going to be given to the Chinese Christians. I thought I could go freely back to China someday to teach Christian leaders and to preach at churches. But I was wrong. Until in 2015, the underground seminary where I teach was raided while my students were gathered in Shanghai to take the seminary course on Christology. In 2016, authorities started to install facial recognition cameras in churches and banned anyone under 18 to attend church. In 2017, several Christian friends of mine told me they had nowhere to worship because their churches were forcibly closed down and their Bibles and Christian books were taken away. In 2018, my former pastor in Orlando was deported from China on a mission trip there. And also, one of the ruling elders of the church, upon arrival at Beijing airport, was taken out of the airplane by force and, of course, denied entry to China. In 2019, my own parents informed me that their church no longer exists because authorities have forced the landlord to terminate the rental contract to the church. I just didn't see it coming. As one writer once wrote, persecution is not just a historical atrocity, it is a current reality. It is clearly taught in the scripture that there will always be persecutions. The Lord Jesus himself said, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Ever since the first group of Christian believers, the Christian church is a persecuted church throughout the entire church history. Whether we experience it or not at this moment, there will 
always be persecutions. That is why Hebrews 13.3 is particularly important to us. Remember those who are in prison, as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. When we hear those numbers of statistics, when we consider our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world being persecuted, beaten, oppressed, imprisoned, tortured, even killed, we are, according to this verse, to remember them. To remember them as though we are in prison with them. To remember them as though we're going through the same persecution in our bodies. This is imperative given by the author of Hebrew to us. We're entrusted with a responsibility, a God-given responsibility to remember the persecuted Christians around the world. We're exhorted to remember those who are persecuted for the sake of their Christian faith, our Christian faith, even as we worship here in this room today. The meaning of the text, Hebrew 13.3, is fairly straightforward. Only one exhortation is given to believers, which is a verb that is in the imperative mode. The first word you read in this verse, that is, remember. We're called to remember those who are in prison. We're called to remember those who are mistreated. Now the question is, how do we remember? We live in a very different culture than China where the imprisonment and mistreatment are taking place. Even for me, ministering a Chinese church in Florida is vastly different from the life of a pastor in China. In this sermon, I'm going to ask three questions. Whom do we remember? Why do we remember? And how do we remember? By answering those questions, my goal is to expound the meaning of this verse and to provide some practical ways through which we can better remember the responsibility that God has entrusted to us. The first question is, whom do we remember? Again, the answer is fairly straightforward from the text. The text says, those who are in prison and those who are mistreated are the people we need to remember. If you read the context of this verse, this call is given in a broader exhortation that is found in verse 1. If you read verse 1, let your brotherly love continue. We might not be surprised by the saying of brotherly love, which is, by the way, Philadelphia in Greek. However, it is in fact a rather abrupt way to introduce Hebrews chapter 13. The term brotherly love turns up rather infrequently in the first century everyday use and infrequently found in the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. The word brotherly love primarily is referred to as a natural affection of siblings. However, among early Christians, the term brotherly love is used distinctively to describe the love that binds together members of the church as though believers are truly brothers and sisters. Even our Lord Jesus Christ called his disciples brothers. The exhortation is to exercise brotherly love. And whom do we do so to? Remember those who are in prison. Remember those who are mistreated. It is important for us to realize that those who are in prison, those who are mistreated for the sake of their faith, are indeed our brothers and sisters in Christ. 
Think of it this way. If your own brother or sister was suffering because of their faith in Christ, how would you respond? If the persecution was taking place where you lived, in your city, to your own family, how would you respond? You would not need to be reminded to remember them because you will remember them. It would, it would be even fresh to you as a daily or even hourly need in your life. You would think of them. You would pray for them. You would make efforts to rescue them because they're part of the family. Did you realize the Christians around the world who are suffering for the sake of the gospel are also part of the family? Apostle Paul writes, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. We're called to remember those who are persecuted, to love them as brothers and sisters. Brothers here are more than just a title or, or reference. That is indeed who they are. They are our brothers and sisters in Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 26 writes, If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Paul writes it very clearly here. When one, part, when one part of the body suffers, we all suffer. When one part of the body hurts, we all hurt. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the body is suffering around the world. Our brothers and sisters are hurting around the world. Sitting back here like nothing is going on is not the New Testament picture of being one family in Christ. Today, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the persecuted churches in China. They are the ones whom we should remember. Let me share with you a few stories that took place among believers of the persecuted Early Rain Covenant Church. Li Yingqiang is one of the elders of the church. Before he was arrested on December 9th, 2018, he published a handwritten letter to encourage his members to stand firm in their faith and to continue public worship. After being arrested, he was detained at a secret location, and no one has been able to make communications. Four and a half months after he was arrested, unable to reach him, his wife wrote an open letter on April 30th, 2019. She writes, Today, I just have one thing to tell you. Only a few sentences. Being in prison for the Lord and suffering for righteousness' sake are good things. Go in peace and do what you need to do. Regardless of whether you are in prison for two years or three years or eight years or ten years, we will wait for you. We will joyfully wait for you. Last night, the children asked me, how can we let Daddy know that we're okay so that he doesn't worry about us? I answered, the angels will tell him. Christ Covenant Church, whom do we need to remember? Those are our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ we need to remember. The members of the Early Rain Covenant Church did obey their elder very carefully. After the church was shut down, they continued to gather each Sunday, privately at homes, publicly outside at parks. They just would not give up worshiping together. 
as a church. After released from the state prison, some church leaders were house jailed, therefore unable to continue to shepherd the church. However, dozens of believers came surrounding their houses each Sunday to hear them preach. On Sundays, loud sermons would come out from those guarded houses. The believers just would not give up corporate worship. Each time they gathered, a number of believers were arrested. On February 24th, 2019, when the members of Early Rain Church gathered again for public worship, 44 of them were arrested. Of those arrested, 11 were children. The youngest was only barely two months old. Christ coming to church. Whom do we remember? The persecuted church, the persecuted believers are those we need to remember. The church was closed. The leaders were arrested. The believers were harassed. But none of it would stop God from calling his people to gather together and worship him. One mother in the church, while husband being arrested, asked her two young children, we have two options. Either mommy keeps going to church and gets arrested, or mommy stops going to church and gets to stay at home. Which one would you choose? The two little children answered without any hesitation, do not stop going to church. On social media, there are pictures, videos, written testimonies of what the members of the church went through in detention. They were verbally abused. They were violently beaten. They were even forcibly administered medical substance in order that they could be coerced to forfeit their faith, and even worse, to bring false charges against their own pastors and elders. Christ's covenant church, whom do we need to remember? We need to remember the suffering brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to remember the persecuted church. Question number two, why do we, rem- why do we need to remember? Part of the answer was already given when we considered question number one. The key to answering this question, why do we remember, is to uncover the meaning of the second half of this verse. Remember those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. There are, in fact, two ways to understand the meaning of this text. The first explanation is that We need to remember those who are mistreated because we are also members of the body. We also are in the body. We need to remember the suffering believers in the world because they are our brothers and sisters. We need to remember them because we are of one body with them. We we all are of members of one body. This is the first way to understand the meaning of this verse and the first reason why we need to remember them. The second way to understand the meaning of this verse, and I believe is a more probable meaning of this text, is that we need to remember those who are mistreated because we also have bodies. We also are in the body. We also are of bodily existence, and we also live in this real world of everyday life. This is the second reason we need to remember. The exhortation here is, in fact, an exhortation of imaginative sympathy, which is to be extended to all those who are mistreated for the sake of their Christian faith. Why do we need to remember them? Because number one, we are also members of the body. 
And number two, we also have bodies. We would feel the same ill treatment if the persecutions were meted out to us. Remember those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. I just offered you two possible meanings of this text. Either one you think is more probable. However, I would argue the deeper reason why we need to remember the persecuted church is because of Christ. Christ is the reason behind either explanation. Firstly. Christ, our Savior, is the reason why we can be members of one body. If it were not for Christ, those persecuted believers are not brothers and sisters of ours. It is in Christ we are of one body. It is by union with Christ we are united to one another. It is Christ who is the head of the body. We become part of the body. It is Christ who, as the only begotten Son, died for our sake, so that we become adopted children of God, part of family with God. Christ, our Savior, is the real reason why we need to remember the persecuted church. Secondly, Christ. Our Savior is the one who is also in the body to remember us. If it were not for Christ, we have no salvation. We have no hope. Therefore, no need to remember whatsoever. It was Christ who had no body, assumed to himself a true body and a reasonable soul, so that. He could save our body and our soul. It was Christ who did not count himself equal with God, humbled himself, endured the miseries of this life, the wrath of God, the cursed death of the cross, in order to remember us. It was Christ who, for our sake, suffered, beaten, tortured, killed. Identified himself fully with sinners like us to a point that he took the penalty of all our sin. Christ is the one who's in the body to remember our need. Therefore, he calls us to remember those who are suffering, who are in need. Why do we need to identify ourselves with the persecuted believers in the world? Because first and foremost, Christ identified Himself with sinners like us. We are to remember the persecuted church because our Lord firstly remembered us. That is why we need to remember. And final question: How do we remember? How do we remember? I offer the answer in three ways: We learn, we pray, and we expect. The exhortation of the text is: Remember those who are in prison, as though in prison with them. Remember those who are mistreated, since you also. Are in the body. If we do not even know who are in prison, if we do not even know who are mistreated, how can we remember them? Well, of course, there are issues of the heart to consider. I think one major and quite simple reason we do not remember well is because we're not aware. There are many resources for American Christians to get information. About what persecuted Christians in the world are going through. I'm going to name a few here. Open Doors USA has been publishing World Watch List, which provides information 
on the top 50 countries where persecutions on Christians are taking place. China Aid has been publishing annual reports with detailed recordings and statistics to uncover and reveal the realities of persecution among Christians in China. Those, among many others, are excellent resources for us to first learn about Christian persecution. So the first step to remember is to learn, to learn about them, to be aware of what is going on in this world. After we learn about what is taking place, we need to pray. Like how the apostles prayed, prayed for the persecuted church recorded in Acts chapter 4, we are to pray in the same way. We need to pray for three things. Number one, we need to pray for the boldness of the church. We need to pray for the boldness of the church. We need to pray that believers would persevere in the midst of persecution. Christians would be bold to take opportunities to share their faith. Number two, we need to pray for the honor of Christ. We need to pray for the honor of Christ. When persecution is happening, it is the name of Christ that is threatened. We need to pray that Christ's name be honored even in the middle of the persecutions. We need to pray that God's glory be known among the nations. And number three, we need to pray for the advancement of the kingdom. We need to pray for the advancement of the kingdom. We trust that only God can build up his church. And God, in many instances in history, strengthened and expanded his church through persecution. We need to pray for his kingdom come. As lives are transformed, churches strengthen even in the seasons of persecution. The members of my church are encouraged to pray at a specific time of the day. I encourage you to do the same. Hebrew 13.3 here is a key verse. 13 hours, 3 minutes is 1.03 p.m. 13.3, 1.03 p.m. At the end of your lunch break, before going back to work, think of Hebrews 13.3 and take a bit of time to remember the persecuted church in your prayer. We learn, we pray, and we also do not lose hope. We expect. We expect that the Lord is still, is always in control. We expect that all things work together for good. We expect the outcome is secured by the blood of Jesus Christ. We expect the gospel to succeed. We expect to see one day a great multitude from every nation, from all tribes and people and languages standing before Christ, praising his name. We expect to see a new heaven and new earth come down as the old one passes away. We expect, we expect to see no more persecution as he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. We expect to see our Savior face to face, who remembered us, who was persecuted for us, sitting at the throne, fully honored and glorified, as we say, to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for a son, Jesus Christ, who remembered us, who is in the body with us, for us. 
We thank you for the hope that we have in the gospel, that even as we see this many persecution, you are still sovereign. You are still building up your church, and you will bring the nations to you. We ask you, O oh Lord, to comfort and strengthen your children who are suffering. We ask you, O oh Lord, to make us a remembering church. As you called us, remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them, and remember those who are mistreated, since we also are in the body. It is in the name of the one who first remembered us we pray. Amen.